Hello, and welcome to Book Passages Conversations with Authors. I'm your host, Paula Farmer. This event is part of a special edition in honor of Women's History Month. All month, we're uplifting women's voices, stories, and issues. And tonight, we're going to take a bit of a dive into the important and often controversial subject of abortions. Um, this is especially timely given recent dynamics of the US Supreme Court and the threat to Roe v. Wade for the first time in about 50 years, I think, if my math is right. Um, before I introduce our guest, I'd like to encourage you to definitely participate and engage by hitting that chat and putting in comments and questions. I promise we will get to it before the end of the discussion from our two guests, featured guests. So probably about 15 or 10 minutes to the top of the hour, we'll take your questions. But think of it as we're going along and just put them in the chat. Um, tonight's featured book, Focus on Abortion, Americans Share Their Stories, introduces the often missing and most important voices in the abortion conversation. The voices of those who have experienced abortion. Um, 62 uh, individuals are featured. Uh, some of them have had an abortion or are close to someone who has had it, whether it's a family member, a spouse, a friend, um, and each is represented but so to speak, or photographically, I should say, portrait and a first person account, a first person narrative. The storytellers come from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds, generations. They live in urban areas, suburban areas, country areas, and it's all throughout America. And this is making for a broad and complex picture of the issue. Um, Rosalind Banish found her passion when she enrolled in photography courses at the Institute of Design in Chicago. She was drawn to photographing people and over time she realized that she wanted to include what her subjects had to say along with the photographs. This approach of combining photographs and text has allowed her to more fully document human issues. Her previous works include Focus on Living, Portraits of Americans with HIV and AIDS. Joining her and shepherding the discussion is Dr. Uta Landy. Dr. Landy founded and directed two unique national medical education initiatives based at UCSF, the Ryan Residency Training Program and the Fellowship in Family Planning. She recently authored a text called Advancing Women's Health Through Medical Education. And both of them will join us now on the virtual stage of Book Passage. Thank you both for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hello, Uta. Hello, Rosalind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get used to meeting virtually. I know. I, I wish it were in person, but here we are. Me too. In our respective homes, so yes. I'm happy you're at the other end. Yes, and I, I have to say that it's really, really wonderful to have this opportunity to uh, interview in you in this in this forum about this fabulous book that you have uh, put together, and that I feel like I had the privilege of kind of witnessing from it, the moment of conception, if it were. To birth <laughs> now, so uh, it's it's been uh, obviously you know an incredible journey for you, and uh, I, and I'm sure everyone would really like to find out how it all began and what motivated you to uh, to embrace this uh, this topic and 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 to pursue this this topic, you know, in in terms of interviewing these very, uh, very different uh, people. Well, I'll just jump in and say that um, I was very aware of what was happening to abortion access way before the 2016 election. And it, it really frightened me. It was, I think I read that 400 state laws were passed that restricted abortion in various ways 
this was in, between 2011, I think, and 2017. Mm -hmm. And I just deep down have always believed in a, an individual, a person, a woman's right to control her own body. So that, that resonated with me for sure. And kind of carrying that around and seeing what was going on, you and I, met over dinner in 2015 and you were very upset and agitated because you were I don't know what had happened exactly if it was an event or just the general the general mood of our country but you you told me that you felt that abortion access was getting so much more difficult and that we had to encourage and promote the narrative of abortion and that we could do it through stories. Well, that rang a bell with me. And as soon as you said that, I felt, hey, I can do that. I want to do that. I love photographing. I love interviewing people. And I had previously done a book about people living with AIDS in a time when people were not out about their sexuality or even about having AIDS. And it was really considered by many to be a white man's gay disease. And it wasn't that at all. I mean, there were so many other populations that were affected by it. So I, I set out to, with the AIDS project, just to show that it was everybody, you know, it was not a particular demographic and that these people are human and here's what they look like and these are their struggles. So that made me think I could do a, a similar kind of approach to the photography, uh, to the um, abortion project. And that was 2015. And then you know what happened in 2016 and the urgency to actually get moving and doing this was profound. Yes. And I had to figure out how to do it. Yes, yes, that was uh, more urgency than before, although we certainly have felt that urgency from the very beginning since Roe v. Wade, you know, this just whittling down on, uh, on access to care and uh, uh, payments for abortions and et cetera, et cetera. And it just seemed like that kind of urgency uh, was what, you know, was what made this, this book really uh, timely. Yeah, and that's kind of a, a segue to your long career because you've been in this abortion world for so many years um, before Roe v. Wade and you've seen kind of the trajectory of where it has been and where it's coming from. So I hope that in this conversation, you will just chime in and, and give a perspective, a historical perspective, because we need that. I think people forget, um, particularly young people, of what it was like before Roe v. Wade, for example. Um, yes, and 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 Rosalind, I think the kind of sense of desperation, you know, that so many so many women felt in the past, you know, in terms of trying to control their reproductive lives. Uh, it, it was just a very, very profound kind of uh, feeling that, that women had during those, during those early years before legalization. But let's delve into your book first. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, let's, let's find out, you know, what, what were some of your, you know, kind of your obstacles and what what were some of your, you know, the, the kinds of experiences that you had that moved you in some ways or, or that you found especially enlightening, uh, you know? Okay. So obstacles, I don't know if they're obstacles, but challenges. The first one being who is going to volunteer to be in this project? Who is able to be public about their abortion experience? I must say that um, two things happen. Being a photographer, I think from, from the get-go makes you an outsider. So I, I felt always that I was an outsider to this 
very large interconnected world of people who care about reproductive care, who you know are doctors, who are educators, who are researchers, who are doulas, who are mm -hmm. all the people who are Counselors. funders. I mean, the, these Counselors. small yeah. funds and states that provide assistance to people who need abortion who can't afford it. So I would say that through introductions over a long period of time, I, I met quite a few people in this larger world and they were really kind to me. I mean, they were so nice and didn't really um, exclude me because I'm not part of them, but they helped me and they introduced me to people. So it was kind of a, a network of finding people and it also came in unexpected ways. Um, I was at a, uh, a luncheon and a, the oldest person in my book came up to me afterwards and said, this was a fundraiser for, for Dayrell and said, four years ago, I just heard about your project and I'd like to be in it. <laughs> so who would imagine? And she, and she had had a backstreet alley abortion when she was a, a teenager. So, and then uh, there, there are other storytelling projects that preceded me. And one of them I just wanted to mention is called We Testify. We Testify was founded and it's run by Renee Bracy Sherman. And she has created an online platform for telling stories. She's particularly interested in stories from people of color. Uh, she's biracial herself. And she not only finds the, provides the platform for telling these stories but she holds I think she calls them they're kind of I, they're, she doesn't call them workshops I don't remember what she calls them but she meets with them convenes with them and helps them find their story helps them find their voices so Renee was hugely kind to me and introduced me to some of her network of people who are all over the country and um, it's wonderful that she did that and I appreciate her generosity but I appreciate most of all the courage and the bravery and the generosity of the people who told their stories because mm -hmm. it's a big deal it's a huge deal for many people to tell their story and it wasn't like I had an abortion I want to tell you about it it's this struggle over many many months or years to finally come up with the words and the courage to tell the people that you love and the people who are in your life. And then with social media, I mean, it's all over. So. Yeah. And that I have to say uh, that that's a very profound change from the way it used to be, you know, and while we still have this stigmatization of abortion and there's still this idea that this is not something that you very freely talk about with your friends or your family, and that there is this expectation that there would be this, this, this terrible judgment against you. Uh, but in, in you know some some years back, it was just unthinkable, and we didn't have a platform for you know for women to tell their stories. And I think that's what's so special about you know your book. Well, I think the ability for people to tell it in different ways mm -hmm. is um, yeah. quite wonderful. And I, I was part of a panel a short while back where the question came up about social media and the youngest person on the panel, who's a person working in South Texas, said the biggest information about abortion is on TikTok, that that's the go-to platform. So... That's pretty wonderful, I would think. So, so you asked about uh, challenges. The, the other challenge was asking for help, which just personally, I've learned how to do, but it's always been so hard for me. And I needed so much help for this project. I needed people to look at everything and introduce me. And I did a big fundraising to support the project to, ev to everybody. I knew practically, not everybody, but most everybody. So yeah, asking for help. And I'm still doing it because right now I have an exhibit taken from the book called Focus on Abortion, the same name, which is traveling from institution to institution. And I'm asking people for ideas where to 
uh, trying to ho find host venues. It's it's already been to several, which I can tell you about later. So the other part of your question was the the highlights. I think you asked. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and I think the highlight was highlights were showing up after having established a appointment with the interviewee, usually in a city, not my own, not knowing anything about that person, showing up and being wonderfully surprised with what I learned. And I learned so many things along the way. I must say that where to meet the person was, was very much a um, challenge on its own because mm -hmm. people did not have private spaces to invite me to. And because I used a tape recorder, I needed a quiet place and a private place. Mm -hmm. And so it always was back and forth. Can you think of a place? Can I think of a place? And the end result of that is that they were creative and I tried to come up with places, but being on site, they were more creative than I was. And, and the places included public libraries, study rooms, parks, one clinic uh, in Ohio in the dead of winter. A woman suggested the Rockefeller greenhouse in the big public park. She said it's heated and it's light filled. So I not only met her, but I met three, three or four other people from Ohio in this wonderful <laughs> greenhouse and it was snowing outside and icy and I was so grateful for that so that was the other part of it but um I just I don't know if now's a good time but I, I selected a few photographs to share and to read a little bit about but, them because that's I, great can I just ask you for just one last follow-up oh, it, must, it must have been I mean almost like a therapeutic kind of interaction you know I mean the you know these uh these individuals where these women were revealing some very intimate part of their lives and did you did you ever feel like you were kind of a, a counselor or you were in a in a confessing kind of situation and uh well, anything like that well i'm not trained as a counselor so i hope i didn't have that role because i wouldn't have been very good at it but I think I'm a good listener. And yes, I think so that's part of being an interviewer. And yes. I, I listen and some people cried and sometimes I got teary. It, it was very poignant at times. Yes. And obviously you may not be a trained counselor, but but you established a relationship with everyone where they felt they could trust you. Yeah. Um I think so. But it's also self-selecting because people mm -hmm who didn't trust me or didn't feel comfortable about telling their story wouldn't have agreed to meet with me in the right. first place. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so let's well, see it's, some of those stories. So I just want to say that uh, this particular first one I'm going to show is kind of an example of a big surprise for me learning something. I This person I'm going to show is a transgender person um, in Georgia. And he talks about some of the questions I consistently, um, but not all the time, ask people. I ask them about the family they grew up in. I asked, this was in a recorded interview with a tape recorder. I asked them about religious values they were given or not, if that played a part of their decision to have an abortion. I, what were the circumstances of their abortion? I asked about um, who was there for them, who wasn't, how did they access the abortion, how much did it cost? And then kind of looking forward, what, what did they hope life would be like for them? So going down the road, and I must say, I think the older you are and you see how your life has turned out more or less, it might be easier to tell your story than if you're fresh after an abortion and you don't know what's ahead and it's just really frightening. Would you agree, 
Would you agree, Uta? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that kind of retrospective perspective yeah. uh, means means a lot. That kind of wisdom that comes and and you know, and then life goes on. <laughs> yeah. There are so many of your stories, you know, that showed that and what what uh, healing quality that actually had, you know. Yeah. Um, so this is Kazembe. Can you see it? I can't see it on my screen. Is it? Um, can, well, no, 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 no. Can you see? Nope, you can't see it. Let's see. Now? Yes, perfect. Okay. I'm kind of new at sharing. Um, I grew up in a family that was very proud to be Black, very Baptist missionary. My mom was in leadership of the church the whole time I was growing up. My dad didn't really play that much of a role in our life. He was around but my mom was definitely the dominant per parent. People also in this project talk a lot about their mothers, which is interesting. So um, he had a very bad experience in college. He was actually gang raped because they called him gay. And um, down the road, he wrote, um, he said, I'm a non-binary trans person who uses the pronouns he pronouns, who is actively trying to conceive a baby and who's had an abortion. In 2017, I went to a retreat for an abortion storyteller that Renee Bracey Sherman, the woman I just mentioned, created. There was another Black trans person, and I was like, yeah, I don't have to do this by myself. There's another trans person who already understands what I'm going through and what I'm talking about, about doctors, about the abortion about all of the things. Talking about reproductive justice is an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people on both sides. Non-trans people really don't understand how to shift their language to include people who have had abortions who are not women or even talk about reproductive health in that way. Anyway, he goes on and he says, um, now I'm in a relationship and me and my partner are actively trying to conceive. We're waiting for an appointment with a fertility special because we've been trying for months with just a third party donor and I'm not getting pregnant. My doctor told me they're going to call this a geriatric pregnancy because I'm 38 and that probably will need some assistance with the fertility part. I'm going to carry, I got off testosterone a year ago so that I could start having my cycle again so that I could get pregnant. I postponed my top surgery because I want to be able to breastfeed. And he ends with, and I've, I've just taken little bits of this longer interview. I'm a member of basically an all black queer church here in Atlanta. And I'm there every Sunday that I can. The God that's in my life does love me unconditionally and loves everybody. So just showing off in meeting Kazembe, it was a major educational experience for me. It was fun. I just loved it. Yeah, that's really wonderful. That is um, very moving. Oh, very, so very moving. Anyway, um, I, I... I'm very um, concerned with the ongoing stigma and shame connected to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that it'd be fun for you and me to talk about this right now. And I have some other pictures mm -hmm. and statements about stigma to mm -hmm. share with viewers. Mm -hmm. um, you, Uta, in conversations have mentioned to me not only is there stigma amongst people who have had abortions, but amongst physicians who do abortions. So can you talk about that? Yes, yes that has, you know, that has certainly been my experience since I've uh, been in the medical world 
during all this time and, and seen how incredibly oppressive uh, the stigma has been, but it's, it's, it's quite natural. This was a procedure that abortion was illegal, you know, that it had, it had a lot of really negative, ugly connotations, dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then it became legal, it, it became safe. There was a lot of research that has been done. Uh, it, we have really moved you know, moved very uh, impressively toward this much, much more enlightened state. But and that is why I wanted to uh, also write this book about how much you know how much progress we have made toward improving women's and people's health. But uh, but the stigma part is 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 very very is is always. Under underneath, and a whole chapter in my book is devoted to that stigma that that physicians uh, that physicians are facing. Uh, I would say we have made enormous progress. We we when we first started our programs uh, of uh, having uh, teaching faculty in various medical schools in the country, uh, they they would talk about how in the hospital. You know, when they mentioned the word abortion, they would say abortion. They would feel like they had to lower their voice to even mention that dreaded word. And I, I think we have, you know, made huge progress, but not enough, <laughs> Rosalind. Well, maybe just um, briefly tell viewers about the program that trained physicians and fellows in abortion care because most, I don't know if it's most or many, medical schools don't even teach it anymore. Is that correct? Well, we have made a lot of progress in that way. And I, I would say, you know, that this, the, the acceptance of abortion as an, and family planning as an integral part of women's health care uh, into medical education and medical training has been and research has been just uh, uh, has been a quiet what I call a quiet revolution uh, because it's not out in the media nobody hears about it and and it's fine because you know we don't want any interference with the teaching hospitals that are you know state affiliated institutions where the legislators you know will be very quick to prohibit any kind of uh, teaching or service delivery related to abortion. So, but the, the programs, the two programs, the Ryan program and the fellowship program, you know, through the Ryan program, which is focused on just OBGYN, obstetrics and gynecology residents. And we now have programs in 107 medical schools around the country where family planning, teaching all about abortion and contraception is just a normal integrated part of resident education. And then fellowship, we have 500 more than 500 fellows that have been educated to address the more complex uh, issues in abortion care. You know, we, we hear a lot about the easy part okay. and a lot of the research that has led to that uh, was conducted actually by our fellowship community. So uh -huh. those that's a whole new group of experts who teach, who do research and who advocate and who really are totally, completely devoted to this field. Well, that's totally encouraging, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> you mentioned at one point the number of alum students you have from your program. The residents, yes. We've trained more than... Uh, well, we have trained 7,000, I just checked the numbers, 500 residents. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of people. So they're now practicing all over the country. Yes, yeah, those, so those are all physicians and even, you know, not all of them are doing abortions, uh, but they certainly have learned that, that this is part of, you know, of their field and mm -hmm. they support their colleagues and, you know, and they will refer women, you know, and, you know, they will do everything and they will advocate too, you know, 
uh, if that opportunity arises. So I think we have created a very large group of, uh, of professional people, you know, who are completely dedicated and who really are supportive. And boy, now is the time that, you know, we need to have that. Mm -hmm. So between those positions and I think in all the women, mm -hmm. Rosalind, we've had but 50 million women who've had abortions? Yeah. Well, getting back to the stigma that I am aware of through just living in our country and also with the people I, I met, it's, it's really huge. And if you think this is a good time to click on a few more photos and read their uh, comments about stigma, I'm happy yes. to do that. Is it a good time? Yes, and, and, and how, you know, to realize how persistent that is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if um, I can show two pictures side by side, but I'm going to do one at a time because it's a comparison. Um, let me see what I can do here. Okay, uh, this is a woman I met who at 12 years old or 13 years old didn't even understand how babies were conceived, had no sex education, was hanging around her sister's older friends in high school and got pregnant. Um, can you see? A yes. Of a kid? Yes. So um, she, I'll, I'll read from her. I'll, I'll show you the person as an adult. Uh, and I'll, I'll, can you see her now? Yes. In an escort? Perfect. Yes. yes. Okay. And side by side, they're in the book, they're quite powerful because they definitely have the same look all those years later. So when she got pregnant, her, her parents took care of it. Um, and they, this is what she said. I never talked to another person about my abortions until I was 40 years old. So you can see how many years that was. I met a woman through church. We hit it off and we were at her house and she started talking about an unintended pregnancy when she was young. Her parents had sent her away to have the baby and put it up for adoption. It was the first time anybody ever talked to me about an unplanned pregnancy. I just started telling her everything about me. It was a flood of relief to finally tell someone she was compassionate. When I was hit puberty, I didn't understand what was happening with my body. I remember getting my period. My mother gave me the pads and told me to wear them. It was like, this is a woman's lot. This will happen every month. When we ran out of pads and one day my mother told me to use one of her tampons, she explained what to do with a tampon. I was horrified. I didn't even know there was a place in my body for something like that to fit. So she told her mother at this young age that she was pregnant. She drove me to a doctor in the doctor's office, it was just this old man doctor in me. He was feeling around inside of me and it hurt. I was scared. I was pregnant, of course. My parents said, we're going to take care of this and you must go along. This was in 1973, just after Roe v. Wade. I don't know how they arranged the abortion, but I do know it felt punitive. My father was ashamed of me. He told me never to tell anyone, ever not even my husband when I grew up and got married. So I just buried the secret for 27 years. And I internalized the message to this, that it was so horrible, nobody can know about it. And then um, she became, once she told her story and told her family and figured out how to do that, she said, um, I became a volunteer at a clinic escort here at the time it was Georgia in 2015 
the aunties who picket it outside, they're daunting and cruel. It's emotional violence. I tried to be a comforting presence for a person coming for care. My first escorting experience was in Kentucky at a clinic at a busy street. They had protesters, very aggressive. One of the protesters was a preacher man. He got right up in my face with his bullhorn telling me I was evil, I'm going to hell. I stood there with my chin up, my head high, and I looked at him in the eyes. I never looked away. It was very empowering for me. I was terrified, but it really was the first time that I held my head up high. I spent a lot of my life literally looking down at the ground. Here, I was facing the worst of it. I thought, I'm going to do this as long as I physically can. And then she ends with, I recognize that I'm a privileged white person who did not have trouble accessing care. It's my duty to do what I can to help others get care. Fighting the stigma is part of that process. Fighting the stigma is part of that process. Even my being silenced for so long was a gift because it taught me not to judge people you don't know. Everybody deserves compassion and love. My experience has given me a wide open heart for other people. My biggest dream is that the words of my story will float out there and meet the person who may be helped by hearing them. So pretty, pretty powerful. And she's out there doing all that she can to break stigma. And uh, Rosalind, I think those, you know, those people who are clinic ex escorts are incredible heroes. Uh, they are really fantastic. They are brave because they get assaulted and insulted all the time. Yeah. And I, I also wanted to make another point, you know, in terms of uh, with, you know, finally coming out with having had the abortion for doctors, it is uh, being open about what they are doing, that they are performing abortions to their uh, religious relatives or to their grandmothers or to family members that they feel would really condemn them for doing that. And that is also, you know, a very, very powerful moment. And many of them, we actually have workshops yeah. so that we can talk about it and we can, they can support each other uh, in, in, in terms of those experiences. And many times when they actually did find the courage to talk about it, their grandmother would say, actually, I also had an abortion. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you that story. So the more we open it up, yeah, like you are doing, the more we will all be, we, we all realize why that it's 50 million women who have had abortions. Yeah, since Roe v. Wade, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, I think I found that what you just reported came up often that I really, I mentioned previously that mothers came up a lot. So it was like, I really wanted to tell my mother, but I just couldn't, I didn't want to disappoint her. She had all these ideas for my future, but I finally told her. And then she told me, I wish you had told me because mm -hmm. I could have been there to help you. And I had an abortion when I was 18 or 17 or 24, whatever. So yeah, and I think hearing stories gets other people to tell stories. Um, exactly. And I yeah. think that uh, David, I say in the story core, um, you know, telling those stories really is a rich, rich experience. They're all in the Library of Congress. Now he's doing little um, animations to go with them. But I kind of, to wrap my head around a story, I, I need to see the person face and mm -hmm. I think that that allows taking the whole thing in empathy learning kind of moving from some position so so the photography part of of the story to me is very important um to have both actually yeah and you know in terms of the physicians there's also this incredible violence uh, yeah. has been perpetrated against yeah. them over the years, which just adds a whole other element 
you yeah. know, of, uh, of fear and intimidation. And, you know, and even there were so many that I heard where the husbands uh, of these women physicians were very afraid for them, you know, when, when they realized that they were taking that risk by actually performing abortions. And but how, um, how do you evaluate the risk right now to physicians? Well, <laughs> I think it's, it, oh, there, you know, there's still that incredible violent mm -hmm. undercurrent. And, and mm -hmm. I believe that the National Abortion Federation has documented that there have been an enormous increase, you know, against, for example, abortion clinic violence mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that, you know, is clear, um, clearly emboldened, you know, by the current politics mm -hmm. that we have in this country, and that the, those people who are opposed abortion to abortion, who want to impose their religious point of view on our, all the rest, that they feel completely emboldened, and uh, and that of course, you know, increases the violence, and that increases again, you know, that sense of risk taking yeah. when physicians are doing. Yeah. Well, on the subject of, of religion, uh, there's one other person, if there's time, I'd like to share with you, who's a devout Catholic who had an abortion. What do you, th do you think we have time to do that? Yes, it looks like we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you see her? Yes. So yes. This, this is Stephanie. And um, I met her in Southern California, and <clears throat> she she suffered a great deal after her abortion because she wanted to have it, she had it, but her religion kind of was making her feel guilty and full of shame and her her so she said today is the first time i've told my story hiding is part of the shame i have felt speaking out i'm no longer letting this part of my story hold me back this is a choice i made i learned from i can't let it stop me from living my life so after a, a long time of staying away from the church after her abortion she did go back and um, she said, I didn't really understand how God played a role in all of this. Um, I started going to church again because it felt like a call, but I also wanted to get more involved. And I think maybe it's going to redeem myself. So two days before she saw me, she said, I went to confession. And I told the priest, it's hard to come to church when I know the church is pro-life. How do you think it makes us feel to come to church and have that thrown in our face? The priest was very compassionate. He was telling me that he's known a lot of people who've had abortions. He asked that I connect with another lady who also had an abortion so that I had somebody to talk to within the church. He, he recommended that maybe I should become a mentor in the Catholic church for women who've had abortions. So, he, we didn't finish the conversation because there were others waiting for the confession with him. But today she went, the day I met her, she went to mass and the same priest was leading the mass. And during the homily, he started talking about our discussion. I wondered if I had prompted his talk because I went to confession. So I thought that that was kind of a struggle with religion, which a lot of people do, but she came out the other end. And in terms of the picture I chose, it was very upbeat. And um, I, I wanted, it's unlike most of the pictures in the book, not that it's upbeat, but it's in an elevator in the public library we had met and the light was good. And it was just kind of an instant moment. And I, I did it because it just struck me as such a positive picture. And that's where she was in her evolution of figuring out who she was in regard to her religion. Um, and and it, it is, Rosalind, she exudes this kind of positivity. You know, she has this peacefulness in, in her face. You know, there is no agony. She is, 
she's relieved, she feels free. And I love that story because it's so much of the Catholic church, the Catholic hierarchy, you know, that is driving these anti-abortion uh, uh, attitudes and 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 condemnations and and the stigma uh, and you know making abortions illegal again. So it's it, it's it's a wonderful positive story. And I have to put in a plug. Uh, I'm a member of the board of Catholics for Choice. Yes. And I, maybe I need to find out who that priest was because <laughs> it sounds like he needs to join. He needs to join the organization. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Um, it kind of makes me uh, think of a question that people have asked about uh, when you, how do you choose the picture you're going to end up with in the, in the book or in the traveling mm -hmm. exhibit? And it's, it's very interesting. And just with Stephanie, and I'll show you one other, um, I'll show you the picture that, um, Can you see that? Not yet. No. Can you see that? Mm-mm. Hmm. No? Yes. OK. So you know, that's a serious picture. Um, I like serious pictures. But it, it didn't seem to resonate with how she came across in our interview in the library. So I didn't use it. And um, there's there's one other. Um, just to show you, this is the picture I met. Did, can you see her? Yes, yes. She, a wonderful woman I met in uh, Ohio, and she was feisty and strong, and she had a very, very challenging life. And mm -hmm. I just loved her. And we met at the very end of the day, because that's the only time she could meet. She had brought one of her kids with her to the library. And but it was getting really dark, and I like using available light when I can, and I didn't know what to do. And... I, I can't see what picture you're seeing. Um, is she wearing? Yes, she is, has her reproductive rights. Oh, yeah. So that's the picture okay. I used. And then um, these are the ones I didn't use. And I'll, I can, if there's time, I can, I can tell you why. Um, Show us a couple. And she, she did this. Um, on her own, you know, I loved it that she, I didn't tell her to do that, but she just did that. Can you see her? It's <laughs> great. I mean, that, it was so much fun. <laughs> and then, and then the last one, which I love, but you know, it, it, it was dark outside and it was winter and there was no light at all. And I took the headlights of my rented car and I put, oh, gosh. I put it on her and it actually turned out and I love that picture. But then I thought, well, you know, she's not in the street. She doesn't live in the street. And I didn't want any hint um, of misinformation. So I didn't use that one. But that, that's just to show you what goes into the decision yeah. of what pictures to use. Yeah. And that is a very beautiful picture, too. And I, I also... Rosalind thought that a couple of pictures that you actually had of families yeah. in, in the book, you know, like the one here with Pratima Gupta. Yes. <laughs> that, I don't I think happen. I have her up here. Can you have it? Can you yeah. bring her up? I, I can't because I didn't think oh, of that. Yeah. You're welcome to hold it up. <laughs> it was just so such a joyful picture, you know, and she's a physician who is completely committed to providing abortion care and <laughs> doing and educating the next generation since And Uta, you could read the little blurb about how can people say I'm not pro-life when I... Yeah, she says, how can you say that I'm not pro-life when I have two children and I'm giving women their lives back when I'm doing their abortions? Yeah. So I, I think that, because uh, we're kind of running out of time and we, we want to have time for cross-questions, I, I think that... Um, 
my my call to action would be find your voices talk about abortion talk to the people who are in a position to make decisions that affect you um uta will you add to that yes definitely i feel like we do need to we need to stand up we need to this is a very urgent threat to uh to our autonomy to our our uh, reproductive freedom, and we need to rise up and be really powerful and and visible. Uh, oh, now you're frozen. First time. Uh -oh. Maybe come back. Paula, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm glad she said that because I was okay. actually going to call it what it is. Okay. Oh, so you froze on us, Uta. So we didn't hear part of that. Well, did you hear the child, the forced childbearing piece? No. no. Will you oh. say it again? Yes. I. We need to understand that this is not just about making the current political uh, uh, and, and legal trajectory. It's not just about making abortions illegal. It is about depriving us of our reproductive autonomy and it is uh, forcing childbearing on us. It's forced childbearing. We need to call it that. Uh, and we need to get very loud and very, very passionate about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing that up because that actually was one of the questions about what, and for both of you, what you felt like uh, any of us, uh, I mean, obviously, Uta, you're in the medical community and someone was interested in um, what, if there's like a collective of medical community um, uh, activists, um, mm -hmm. or is there something like, you know, almost like they they have to seem unbiased or something when it comes to that. But then for the community at large, um, people want to know from both of you, what are some of the very hands-on practical things we can do to kind of stem the tide of, of what appears to be going on politically that could have, you know, um, you know, long-term impact on reproductive rights. Um, you know, is it political? Is it social? Is it, you know, hit yes. the streets? Um, yeah. Yes, I think it's a it's a combination of all of them, Paula. It really is. I think we do need to go out in the streets at some point. You know, we had the women's march. Uh, what was it, three years ago? I think we need to be visible that way. We need to be visible within our own families and friends and, and, and continue that whole trajectory of overcoming the stigma. And we, we need to, uh, you know, we need to point out to, to, the, to the legislators who are anti-abortion, you know, that, that what they are claiming is that we are murderers and we are not. You know, we are we are women and people, families who, who are making responsible decisions about their lives. Yeah, and I think if anyone is thinking about where don money could be well spent, these abortion funds that I mentioned that are all across the country that really help individual people to travel to another state, which is clearly going to happen more and more to afford an abortion, to childcare, to be put up in a hotel. They, they need every penny that anybody wants to donate to them. It's just really uh, a, a very direct way to make a difference. But I think saying things out loud over and over and over again, look what happened to the gay rights movement. People started telling their stories. People mm -hmm. found out that Everyone has friends, relatives who are gay, mm -hmm. talk about it, it's okay. And I think that changed the cultural conversation and in, in many ways led to today's situation, which is good. I mean, yeah. so much better than it was, not perfect, but and now transgender people are finding their voices. All that needs to happen more and more and more and more. And if you say something out loud, it decharges it, you know, it, it, you get rid of the, 
angst connected to it. So you were saying, Uta, that you know, in hospitals, they used to say abortion in a quiet, whisper way. Well, you shout something out enough times, it, it loses its charge, which is good. Anyway, I don't know if that yeah, is. I think also another great example, I mean, we all saw what happened in 2020 um, with uh, the murder of George Floyd and then the rise of the yeah. Black Lives Matter. Absolutely. Um, and, and the fact that we are continuing to say, we still need to be having these conversations. We still need to be talking about it. Like, and I think that's kind of what you're both saying. You've got to keep talking about it, keep uh, coming together, uh, voicing our concerns and, um, you know, rising to the occasion and not doing it just for the now, but make it very sustainable. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's um, interesting when I read about the amendment passing in Ireland in 18, uh, 2018 that allowed abortion for the first time, they were trying to uh, explain how it could have happened because it was so out of range. And it turns out that in these little villages, women went around to all their neighbors and started talking about their abortions. And then they talked about abortions and it just became a public topic and it helped. And I think that, um, it, we know now that more people in America believe in abortion than not, but you wouldn't know that because people are so uh, kind of in the hands of politicians right now, and we don't hear those voices, which we need to hear. Yeah, and I think um, that brings up a great point of what is really fantastic about uh, your book, Roslyn, um, and why I want to encourage people to definitely um, buy it, gift it, whatever. This is not like some uh, average or your typical coffee table book. It's that kind of size and something you might want to have on display, but it rises above the typical because uh, it's a very um, to topical, important, vital issue, and there's text there. And we were just saying how that may, takes it to a whole different level. It's not just pictures. Although, uh, Rosalind, I'm sure you agree, pictures do tell a story, um, not, but it makes it to a different the level. Yeah. <laughs> we need the, I need the words. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what make your, makes your book stand out and I really want to encourage people to get it. I do want to get to a couple other questions. Um, someone wants to know, Rosalind, um, uh, oh, what is next? Uh, what what uh, social issue uh, topics are you thinking for your next project? Because there's so many kind of hot button button topics: immigration, um, police reform, Black Lives Matter. I mean, there's just mm -hmm. so many issues out there. Are you are you thinking of the next book? Um, let me just say, uh, right now, I'm consumed with working on finding future venues to host this traveling exhibit. It right now is at um, an, an urban university, Roosevelt University in Chicago, and it came from Toledo. And before that it was at Rice. And I just want to get it out there in churches and houses of worship and synagogues and places, kind of accidental spaces where people walk into a community building for some reason other than they don't even know the work is there and it's on the wall and they read it and look at it. And I'm kind of spending a lot of time doing that. So when that's in place and it's gonna be a while, I am kind of torn in taking on another five year, four year project, but I, I would like to, and there are certain subjects that we all know that are looming and just ready to, be explored by me or somebody interested other than me. And that's what I'm thinking about. And uh, <laughs> I hear the fatigue, like I'm just going to do one and I hear you, I hear no, you. No, I, I want to do something and I want to do something. I've always done things that are relevant to my life and mm -hmm. that I'm interested in and all of that. And I, I will do something, but right now I'm just kind of, in between. Yeah, and maybe there are other ways for it to come together. 
-hmm. you know, maybe it doesn't always have to be a, a huge book per se. Um, so yeah, and that's that's yeah, actually other ways to make it come together, you know. Yeah, and people are being so inventive about how they're telling stories. I mean, the book is one way, but there's so many other ways. It's exciting to see how people take material and just take off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, thank you so much, though, for the book, because I think it really humanizes a topic that has become so politicized and um, polarizing. Um, but when you really look through and see the people's faces and their expressions and their postures and things like and then you read their stories, it's like, oh, this is something that impacts actual individuals who have reasons and uh, stories and connections. And I, yeah, I thank you for doing that. And thank you to both of you for this wonderful, important conversation. And I want to remind the audience that we do have copies of Focus on Abortion uh, by Rosalind Banish at Book Passage, San Francisco and Puerto Madera. You can feel safe in coming to the stores to buy or to order online or call up and place an order. Um, we would love to accommodate your order for uh, this very vital book. And um, also want to remind everybody, this is your first time joining us, or maybe you're, you've uh, been coming quite a bit, but you haven't hit that button to subscribe. Please do. It's, it only takes you a second, but it really helps Book Passage a lot to have subscribers to our channel, bringing this type of important programming to you for the future. Um, and also, uh, just to give a plug for tomorrow, we've got a lot going on tomorrow. Please join us again tomorrow, as in Thursday, the 17th, March 17th at one o'clock Pacific time for a conversation with Carol Wallace and Leanne Dolan. Carol's first book was the book that actually inspired the very popular TV series, Downton Abbey. And she has a new book and she's a lovely person that I know personally. And always good to talk to her and get her perspective on things and hear about her new projects. But uh, for now, right now, focus on abortion, get this book. And thank you to both of you, Dr. Landy and uh, Roslyn Vanish, for joining us and breaking it all down for us. And thank you. And thank you, Luda. Thanks. It was wonderful seeing you. Thank you very much. Thank I'll you. I'll be in virtually. Bye-bye.